now. All right. All right. Welcome to the Headless WP podcast. My name is Jeff Everhart. Um, my co-host Fran and I are joined today by Lee Robinson, uh, the VP of Developer Experience at Vercel. Lee's been on the podcast before, so if you're interested in hearing a little bit about his background or his origin story, be sure to check out that episode. Since Next.js continues to be a really popular way to create headless WordPress sites, we wanted to have Lee back to discuss some of the recent updates to Next.js that uh, launched with version 12.2, and just to sort of discuss the basic state of the open source JavaScript ecosystem. So Fran, Lee, welcome today. How's it going? Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and, and chat with y'all. Happy to be back. Lots of good stuff to talk about. And I'm doing really well. It's Christmas in July for me because um, I follow I follow you, Lee. I'm a fanboy. Love Next.js. <laughs> stoked, Jim. Stoked. Yes. All yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this. I'm happy that y'all are familiar with Next.js and Vercel and have been keeping up with some of the stuff that we're doing. And yeah, we we see so many people choosing to use WordPress with. Next year, so it, it makes so much sense. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because like I, as I'm looking over in my mind, you know, things that I'm gonna do with my next content for headless WordPress utilizing Next.js, and pretty much that's I'll um, this might cause like a stir on the uh, Dev Twitter ecosystem, but I love Next.js um, and I love what it does. I love the developer experience as a front end framework for me when it, I spin yeah. it up right out of the box. Um, some some questions I had for you, Lee, is like, you know, with a 12.2 release that just came out um, and things that like it has, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is, you know, what are some use cases that you've seen that you might have done on your own or that you've seen in the wild for middleware and ISR? If we could start there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. So let's let's start with middleware. So just to reset on what middleware is, basically a lot of folks are probably familiar who have been doing web dev for a little bit with the concept of middleware in Express.js, which was, hey, I want to add some logic for all routes in my application. I can kind of put it into this composable chunk and add it as needed. And there was even a, a great NPM ecosystem of packages that you could kind of mm -hmm. add on. The idea with middleware in Next.js, you know, middleware is, is a word that can mean a lot of things. It's used in a lot of different ways. The way I think about it in Next.js is it's, it's kind of like route middleware or routing middleware. So you want to run some code essentially that can run before you navigate to the about page or the contact page. And maybe you want to run it on some routes, or maybe you want to run it on all routes. And it, it's really powerful because it enables developers to have full control over basically whatever logic they want to do with the web standard requests and response objects. I get in a request, I can you know have some response that comes out of a middleware. And maybe I want to add some headers. Maybe I want to rewrite. Maybe I want to redirect. Um, the origin of middleware, I guess, is that we've been talking to Next.js customers for many years now. And one of, I think, and slowly we've added bits of the functionality that are common use cases for middleware into Next.js itself. But then there was always those, well, what if I want to do this thing? It's just a little bit different than what the default is. They need that escape hatch, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about middleware is that you, put the power back in the developer's hands to write whatever logic they want with code and really get the full flexibility in their application. So tangibly what that looks like and how we see customers using middleware, getting really excited about middleware is, uh, especially for e-commerce customers or media site customers, there's a, a large emphasis on personalization and A-B testing. So, the cool thing about pairing middleware with something like ISR or incremental static regeneration that we'll get into for AB testing is I can get the flexibility of having a really dynamic site. You know, maybe I, if this person has visited my site before, I want to send them to a completely different experience, or maybe I'm rolling out some new feature that I want to only show to a specific subset of people. You can do that while still being able to have the option of 
basically rewriting to a static page. So you can get the performance benefits like it was a static site while still having that flexibility to, you know, uh, to answer the request of the team who's trying to make things more personalized or more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. And that is I, <clears throat> yeah, I'll jump in just a second because I got to say, you mentioned Express in there and how you sort of modeled it after the Express middleware API. And as somebody who's done some Express development in the past, that's literally the first words that were out of my mouth when yeah. I tried it. I was like, wow, this feels exactly like Express. This is awesome. And mm -hmm. so, and just to give everybody kind of like another example of how middleware is used, uh, our Faust.js library, which sits on top of Next.js, actually used the middleware beta to proxy sitemaps. So it essentially looked at that request that are they are they looking for like sitemap.xml? And if they are, it would go out to your WordPress origin, get the XML, parse that, you know, rewrite nice. it a little bit and then ship it back. And so oh. um, it is super handy, but definitely y'all nailed the API design if what Express is, was your model. Mm -hmm. That is, so it's interesting for me being a little bit uh, newer as far as my coding experience and coming in with like, <clears throat> so if I was to get hired at a company as a software developer, I'd probably be junior to mid. Right. And I'd probably lean on the likes of Jeff or you, Lee, if I was on your team and going, hey, how, how does this work again? And how, how? so with middleware versus like, because you think of things of in places, right, especially with servers of origin. And then mm -hmm. if you're running a function on a on a Lambda server somewhere, it's somewhere. But mm -hmm. then you have something at the edge at the CDN layer where you're you're almost like doing that, like, because that's another thing with the edge functions. With edge middleware, is that basically, and please educate me, guys, is that just pushing middleware to the edge layer? Is that all that is? Or am I misunderstanding the concept? Yeah. Yeah. So middleware by default, it's, uh, it, it, there's two different ways to talk about it. There's middleware inside of Next.js, and then there's just more in general edge middleware on the Purcell platform. So if we start with Next.js, Next.js is an open source framework. You know, a ton of people use it to self-host on their own infrastructure or build some kind of custom wrapper on top of it. I think, um, if I remember correctly, I think both Lyft and DoorDash have like their own framework on top of Next.js that oh, like wow. extends it with, with basically like company defaults, you know, they want to have their own linting set up and their own uh, code generation and all that other stuff. So for teams like that, you know, they're, you know, maybe they're hosting on their own infra or maybe they're doing something custom. They still want to be able to use middleware, right? So it's open source. It works out of the box when you use Next Start. By default, it's deployed to a single region. So let's say you're self-hosting your Next.js app in uh, US East on AWS, right? Your middleware is gonna run inside that region. This is part of the value proposition that Purcell is providing, which is by default with zero configuration, if you deploy your Next.js app to Purcell, we say, that's great, but what if we could also run your middleware and process those requests in every edge around the world, close to where your customers are at? So if I'm in Australia, and I make a request to my website, ideally those rewrites and those redirects and that logic that is going to be affecting that incoming request, the closer physically, geographically in the world that that happens, the faster the response time is gonna be for the user visiting the site. So then those things are getting pushed out to Australia. You can do your redirect or your rewrite there and it's gonna be faster for your customers. Man, Lee. If I could like paint over my face the mind blown emoji, <laughs> boom. <laughs> Thank you for that explanation, man. That was yeah. We'll add it in uh, post processing, uh, Fran. <laughs> a good a good mental model for me that's helped is a CDN or a content delivery network has historically been used to basically cache versions of HTML, JavaScript, CSS files everywhere around the world. And it was mostly only the read of those things. So I wanna have it faster when I read some file from a cache. And it, CDNs made it really easy, like Vercel, to just deploy your app and automatically put your code in every region around the world. 
Edge compute or an edge network is the write aspect of that as well too. So you wanna read and write some dynamic code in every edge as well. Maybe you want to you know, do the redirects or the rewrites or some kind of custom logic, or even you know, in the future, allowing you to integrate deeply into storage solutions, or you know, even today have access to HTTP. So maybe you wanna call out to a Redis store and store off some data in that edge as well too. It really gives the power back to the developer. That is super slick. That, yeah, that is that is definitely awesome. Um, so, and I know we got a um, we got some limited time. So let me uh, ask the next question. Then Jeff has a, um, something lined up. But um, for the for the uh, moving over, uh, next to the image component in next, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything people should be aware of regarding the image component, um, Lee and? And forgive me if, because uh, I, I was trying to catch up and read up on um, the latest release as far as next image, but is there anything different about it? Is it just more yeah. flexible for, yeah. Yeah, so to reset on the problem, images are an extremely hard challenge to tackle on the web. And the majority of the web is made up of documents that have lots of images in them. Yes. You frequently see people deploy images that are you know, too large, they're not optimized, they're not serving the correct size based on the visitor's device or you know, the visitor's preferences, or they're not taking advantage of the latest features of the browser. So maybe Google Chrome, you can do a new image format like AVIF that's even smaller and helps you get better, um, better page load times. Um, so really what the goal of the image component and automatic image optimization in Next.js is, is to try to make that as easy as possible for the developer experience of, I wanna include an image. How much can I rely on a framework and on my infrastructure to optimize those images and help keep my performance great? Because I, I want my framework to make those decisions for me. Okay, visitor is in Chrome. Let's give them the latest image format. Let's give them AVIF. Okay, they're on a mobile device. So let's serve up a smaller sized image. We don't need to give them the 3000 pixel wide image, right? And make those decisions for me to help me get the best performance. So that's that's the image component in general. And with this new version, um, it's it's now we've 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 basically been listening to feedback on the image component since we originally released it, you know, over a year ago. And basically the overwhelming feedback was this is amazing. This is helping us transform the performance of our applications and really get great core web vitals or a way of, of tracking real user performance. But we want to have more flexibility with how we style. We want to have more flexibility and go back to the roots of the HTML image tag. So this new image component is really our response to this feedback, trying to listen to the community and saying, Okay, let's let's give you the best of both worlds here. We're going to give you what I like to think of as the web native solution. The browser has progressed so much where things like lazy loading are built into most modern browsers. I think it's like Safari 15 mm -hmm. or something is, yeah. is when support is there. So if we can rely on that, we actually ship less JavaScript because we don't have to have this custom React code that is necessary to lazy load images. So by relying on the web platform, we're able to actually delete code and provide a better experience to, uh, to end users. So that's, that's the, the, the whole reason for this new component. And I think in general, if you, if you zoom out a little bit and you look at the similarities between this image component and the edge work that we've been doing, the common theme is rooting ourselves and refocusing on the web platform and web APIs. Because with the image component, right? Like the web platform has evolved so much. Crafts browser support for so many things is better than it's ever been. And we can lean on the web platform to really help us get great performance and provide great interoperability for developers. Same exact thing with middleware. When I'm using request and response in middleware, it's just the web APIs that you've probably used somewhere else 
And you could even go look at the MDM docs if you wanted and still have the same signature for how you use a lot of these things. So it's just, it's a refocusing on standards and interoperability between platforms. That is cool. I think that's I think, fantastic. Yeah, because there's a standard standardization theme that as you were talking, Lee, my, my dev mind was like, yeah, this all makes sense trying to just make it that much easier. So we're not pulling a bunch of different docs at any given time. And we have like 20, you know, tabs up <laughs> trying mm -hmm. to reread. It's just like one standard. So it's like essentially what GraphQL did with the API spec and the layer of that. So yeah, very, very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> and I think you touched on something there about like the web platform coming along and absorbing these really good ideas and integrating them into the platform. And so that I think leads us in a little bit into the next question that we have for you. So the last time you were on the podcast, it was on the heels of the announcement that uh, Vercel was going to sponsor Rich Harris to work on Svelte and Svelte Kit sort of yeah. full time. And I think since then, we've had like other frameworks like Remix and SolidJS kind of bust onto the framework scene mm -hmm. in a big way. And last time you were on, you talked about the idea of frameworks being inspired by one another, which I, I totally agree with. And the idea that, yeah. you know, when we do this, the web wins as a whole. So if you mm -hmm. could kind of continue and maybe share with us how you see those ideas continue to play out like over this next cycle. Yeah, first on Svelte, it's been really fun to get to work with Rich, very smart, very, very humble, very empathetic person and just a great engineer and watch the progress of Svelte Kit and, and really the community just embrace Svelte. It's been amazing. I've been just dabbling with Svelte more and more and I, I really like a lot of the ideas inside of Svelte. Um, mm -hmm. We're about to release a Svelte Kit course that one of the members on my team, Steph, has been working on. It's been super fun for me to like go through that and learn more about Svelte Kit because it just challenges a lot of the ideas that I had already in my head about the way that React works and the way that Next.js works. So I love that because it helps me it helps me become a better web developer by understanding how all these different tools work together. So been really enjoying Svelte Kit and excited for the 1.0 release there. Um, in terms of like the larger state of front end frameworks, it's really interesting because you start to notice this trend, which kind of goes back to what I was talking about, which is alignment on the web. One framework, um, well, there's two, two interesting things to talk about. The first one is Fresh, which is a framework created by Deno. Fresh. And it's, it's, you know, it's also extremely new, but you look at it and it looks very similar to Next.js, but instead there's no mention of Node.js because with Deno, it's, you know, it's this new version of Node.js. It's, it, it has a, a new take on how to build for the web. And if you look at the APIs, it sounds a lot like what I'm talking about with the mm -hmm. request and response and these, mm -hmm. these standard APIs that you probably already know how to use, or you can easily look up the documentation for. And then you look at uh, another tool that's not, it's not really a framework, but it's in the same space, which is called Bun, which was recently announced. And it's- I've seen that, yeah. B Bun? Bun, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, super yeah. fast. It does a lot of things, um, and the 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 main theme, I guess, that's interesting from Bun is it's it's rather than you know implementing some kind of proprietary things, it's again aligning with in this instance like JavaScript core, like just the under underlying ways that you can use the JavaScript language. Um, so the common the commonality between all of this stuff is that developers want to be empowered to write it or learn it once and write everywhere. And this recently, this recently actually worked super well. That for needs me to be because, on a shirt somewhere. Lee. Yeah. Learn Lee, once, you need write to, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. TM that. TM that yeah. Lee. <laughs> yeah. This it, it's, it's funny because it actually became very real to me. I was, I wrote something in a, um, a Svelte kit app. And I think it was like how I was uh, setting the headers on a response. And, you know, it's just the, the web response, the headers object that you can return. And then I was using middleware. I'm like, oh yeah, I already know how to do this. Like, it's just the web response. Like oh. you can just slap these headers on here. I already know how to throw this cache control header on. And that's really exciting for me because I feel like I'm becoming 
a better web developer by learning these platform APIs. So it's, it's kind of this transition slowly away from the reliance on Node.js. I don't think Node.js realized it was going to evolve to the, the bedrock of, the, of a lot of web infrastructure as it has today. But critically, I think the big difference in where Next.js is going and maybe some of these other frameworks are going is that we were really excited about the world of Edge and alignment with the web platform. But we also understand that people aren't gonna be able to rewrite their apps overnight and they might not be able to move away from the Node.js or the massive NPM ecosystem right away. So Next.js's approach is like this new stuff, very cool. We're gonna help teach you about all this new stuff. But at the same time, maybe you're working on a really large React application. It's been in production for years. You don't necessarily have time to go like rewrite with the latest hotness, mm -hmm. brand new framework. <laughs> yeah. You're just trying to get your job done, right? And maybe yeah. you want to try some of this stuff, but again, time is limited. So what Next is doing is it's, it has now a concept of a runtime. So you can tell your next app, I either want the whole thing to work in Node or I want the whole thing to work in the Edge runtime. And going further, you can actually do that on a per page or a per API basis. So oh, if wow. I'm building a, oh, you know, yeah. a massive Next.js app, massive React application, I upgrade to the latest version of Next.js. I'm like, wow, all this Edge stuff sounds really cool. I kind of want to start trying it out and, and seeing it. I actually had a conversation with one of our partners and uh, for sell customers, PlanetScale. They have a really awesome serverless database. Oh, and they yeah. were like, yeah, we just started using uh, edge api routes for one extremely small piece of our application like just one super small thing and it was cool because they didn't have to rewrite their whole app they didn't have to change frameworks all they did was just update to the latest version and they could slowly start trying out this new stuff and critically i think from a like from an engineering standpoint make sure it was better like just just because we have this new stuff and edge is cool and it sounds exciting it's good, I think, for, for teams to be empowered to like try it out, run some tests, check the latency. Like, is this actually making an improvement? If yes, then absolutely, you can slowly move over more stuff. But being grounded in the like experimentation of that, I think, is really important. Yeah, that makes total yeah. sense. Because I think there's, there's that thing where you have that dopamine hit not even just in engineering or development, but just as a human being, when a new hotness comes out, y'all, you know what I mean? A new hotness and you're like, oh, that new hotness might optimize me better. Whatever it is you're doing, in this case, it's web development, mm -hmm. but you don't realize that moving over to that new hotness, there's a, there's a little bit of a learning curve and then you have to shift your old hotness to the new hotness and then there might, things might break and stuff like that. So oh, yeah. that's, yeah, yeah, Lee. <laughs> Trust yeah. Me. Well, it's... <laughs> I was just going to say one one thing that we've been impressed on us as as developers as web developers especially as front end developers especially is the landscape is always changing and there's always new tools there's always new developments happening and you can either take a pessimistic or an optimistic view on that the pessimist will say there's so much churn in the ecosystem this is bad the optimist will say these new tools are challenging you know, what makes a great experience and ultimately helping push the web forward. So my part of my job and part of what I hope to leave an impact on the community is making sure that I properly explain the trade offs of some of these things, because, you know, Vercel is talking a lot about edge. I think edge is awesome. There are trade offs like you might not want edge. You know, maybe you wouldn't expect, you know, Lee from Vercel to come on and be like, yeah, actually don't use our product for that. But like, <laughs> it's, it's true. Like you might not want to use edge compute for some stuff. So it's important for me also, while I talk about all the latest cool stuff is to also refocus on like, yeah, this is another tool in your tool belt. It's, it's similar to like how you still might want to use Node.js in, in um, Next.js. It's like, this is cool. It's, it's in your tool belt. You have this framework that's enabling it, but here are the things you could should consider when you're making a decision like that. Yeah, I, I, and it's it's always one of my um, mentors uh, 
who, who's over at Netlify, Jason Langsdorf, he always tells me, Fran, when a developer asks you, what should I use, especially when they're going, Fran, what do we do? Headless WordPress or traditional WordPress? Mm. Two words, y'all. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. depends. Yeah. And it really does depend to your point, Lee. Mm -hmm. Like upon the use case, what they're using, the stack, the organization, the company as a whole, what their mm -hmm. marketing teams are used to using, what their do they have JavaScript? All that stuff goes into like these kind of decisions that you have to make when um, you're evaluating what what do you actually use and is it necessary? Is the new hotness necessary? Is it not? What what not? So do you use yeah. it? Do you not? Yep. And and I think there's an interesting thing in there too, Lee, from what you said about sort of your responsibility to the current users of Next.js. Because yeah. like obviously that's sort of the front runner, front end framework, if you will, right? You have lots mm -hmm. of people already using it. And so it's tough, like, so how how do you all balance that where yeah. you, you kind of got this responsibility to these people who are already using it? Um, mm -hmm. And then you also want to be innovating because I find like we're there are a lot of corollaries there to the way that I view like the WordPress open source project. Like they have a huge commitment to backward compatibility, large yeah. user base. And so like you've got to balance these two things as the, you know, the de facto, mm -hmm. I guess, front runner. Yeah, I think there's two things to talk about there. One is... For sales open source efforts in general, and then to how we think about that in sort in in terms of Next.js. So, first, just for sell in general, one of the reasons why I was really excited to join the Vercel team, you know, two years ago now, was Vercel was a company that I looked up to in terms of investing in the open source ecosystem yeah. and making tools for developers. So, since the beginning of Vercel back in you know 2015 2016. Um, Next.js came out in 2016, and at the time, the Vercel team was putting out just a ton of great open source software, not only solving their own problems, but also helping push the ecosystem forward. And that's been a core fundamental part of how Vercel operates from day one and still today and, and putting out lots of great open source software. And what's really interesting is not only have we been building our own software, we've also been you know, helping support the ecosystem and bringing in folks who love open source as well too. So I recently had a tweet where I said, uh, you know, for cell engineers have helped create or maintain all of this open source software. And I, I asked in one of our Slack channels and people were just like sounding off with so many amazing packages. Some of them I didn't even know about. And it really just blows my mind how this, this collective of people who really care about building an open web platform and like open source software to support that have all conglomerated towards Vercel. So that's like, that's Vercel as a whole, but then specifically with Next.js, it's, it's grown so much since 2016 and especially oh, yeah. in the last, like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, in the last man. two years, Whew, it's, rocket ship. it's, it's yep. really taken off. And to do that, like you said, there's a responsibility from you know, for me, leading the developer experience of the tool and of our company, there's a responsibility to make sure that it works just as good when I self-host it as when I deploy to Vercel. And I think what's critical there is like, we have to have a kind of a, a hard stop. It's like, if you make a new feature, it has to work in Next.js open source. Like, it's not like we're going to build a proprietary um, Vercel only Next.js feature. The model is Next.js works great self-hosted and you you should still consider using it self-hosted. It's it's great that way too. Vercel is like Next.js plus plus. Like you can you can deploy it with additional features, like let's say image optimization, right? You can host it self-hosted and it works, but then when you deploy it to Vercel, you can optimize images around every region in the globe. So it's kind of like a single region to multi-region model. Yeah. Um, depending on how far you want to optimize. And then critically too, a lot of folks know about Vercel in, in terms of Next.js, but we really support any front end framework, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, whether it's the Nuxt or the Svelts of the world. So we have a responsibility too, to be agnostic to all of the really cool frameworks that people are building and supporting today and having zero configuration support for them when they land. So most recently, I think the last one we had support for was Shopify's Hydrogen. You can now oh, deploy that with neat. zero configuration neat. and it uses edge functions to like serve a render, which is super cool. Oh. Um, 
So it, it's a it's a dual responsibility to support the ecosystem and provide infrastructure for all of these cool frameworks, as well as making sure that you know the many Next.js customers who self-host and they run on their own infrastructure, like they still come to me sometimes and ask questions, and I still want to help support them, even if they're not using Vercel. Like Aww. I still have a commitment to them, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's important because you just use the word customers, even mm -hmm. though they're not paying you. And I think exactly. like having that same responsibility to serve them is is really important and cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of my like some of my absolute favorite Next.js customers too. You know, they they don't host on Vercel, and that's okay. I'm not gonna you know blow them yeah. up about their their <laughs> choice because maybe there's you know some internal reason that they've chosen not to that's totally fine i still want them to succeed with the tool i still want them to have a good experience i still want them to be able to talk to our team and make feature suggestions and like get their bugs fixed man yeah not only a kick-ass developer but you're an amazing human being lee uh, that, that is awesome <laughs> Thank you. i think and i honestly believe and i look it's funny because this kind of just segues into the question I was going to ask, but we could just overlay on it in in the open source is open sourceness of WordPress and Next.js on how mm -hmm. both our companies Lee mm -hmm. hire people that have this mindset just as you displayed of kindness toward even if you're not hosting on us, mm -hmm. but you're using our open source tools and our software, we will still help you and we're compelled to help you. Mm -hmm. Because just for the overall, in our industry, the overall internet and the web, we want people to become developers. We want people, it doesn't matter what you use, we're just stoked to help y'all because the bigger we grow as a, a whole unit, it's just good mm -hmm. for the entire, mm -hmm. yeah, industry. So and, yeah. yeah, anyway, but yeah. And it's great I, to see a lot of other companies adopt that posture as well. Because like, when I look at, you know, something like Ghost, CMS, like that's another mm -hmm. good yeah, example another of a company that's built on top of an open source, you know, you have um, Strappy open source kind of then also this paid SaaS product. So it's it's really cool to see. I think a, an important thing too to, to emphasize is like part of the reason why I joined the Vercel team and why I really love working with all the Vercel folks is like, I truly believe that we're building a world-class product and I'm happy every day to go advocate for it and tell people you should check out Vercel. Does that mean that sometimes people won't use Vercel? Yeah, absolutely. And that's okay. But I do believe, and I'm excited about advocating that we are building something that's good and that benefits the web. So for me, it makes the almost like the the ethics of it easier. It's like, if you're gonna choose Vercel, I feel really confident, like you're gonna have a good time and I wanna help support you on that journey. I feel the same way about Next.js. Like if you want to put Next.js on your own, uh, your own infrastructure, like maybe you have, you run your own servers or something in your, in your, uh, in your warehouse, like that's awesome. Like we still want you to be able to upgrade and build with the latest tools. Man, that is, that is awesome. So yeah, that's that fantastic. Cool. So we'll switch gears a little bit. Uh, and this is maybe a question that I, I selfishly and maybe Fran are a little bit more interested in having answered than our users. But you recently wrote a fantastical article on the importance of developer experience or DX. So I was hoping you could talk with us a little bit about the relationship between developer experience and developer relations. And mm -hmm. also in that article, you mentioned uh, a strategy of going both hyper-global and hyper-local and was hoping you could kind of elaborate on what that looks like for your team. Yeah, let's let's start with the last part. The hyper-global, hyper-local one is is really interesting because DevRel as a, as a whole and as an industry has changed a lot post uh, an event in 2020. It's like it's like Voldemort. It's like the the event the event <laughs> that shall should not, not be named. named. Should not yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. I just like that thing that happened yeah. in 2020 <laughs> that everybody knows about. Yeah. <laughs> but since then, uh, I feel like the role of of DevRel or Dev developer advocates has changed a little bit. Especially, I was kind of confronted with this in the return to developer conferences, in-person developer conferences, because for the last two years, you know, we've been doing so many online events and everyone was so excited to get back in person to go to these events. And now after going to, you know, a handful here in the past months, 
it's it's very interesting because while they're all while they are like very excellent and it's a great way to meet with your community it also makes you understand the value of interacting with your online community too like that mm. part oh. was probably underserved prior to everyone realizing how important it was to connect with people all around the world so i think now you're seeing a lot of developer teams developer relations teams when they announce an, a conference or an event, you know, it's it's online and in person. Like hybrid is probably something that's going to be here to stay. And the the focus is on providing the best experience for your entire global audience. Because you probably, if you're building a developer tool, like you probably have a, a global audience of people because developers are all over the world now. And you want to help all of them succeed. But then you also want to provide these great local experiences for the pockets of developers who want to get together and collaborate in person. It's not as feasible to, you know, fly people all over the world into like one location for some massive event, nor mm -hmm. do they maybe even want to do that. So I think there's, and also going even further on that, I think that there's sometimes even better engagement and better community when it's a smaller event, like a 50 person, a hundred person yeah. thing versus like a, a thousand person thing, yeah. you can really get closer with some of those people and have a different experience. So the way I'm, I'm thinking about developer relations and where I'm wanting to take it in the future is still keeping a focus on like satisfying the entire global community of people in the, the Vercel community, in the front end framework communities like Next.js and like helping them be successful. But then also we've been doing like hyperlocal meetups in different cities. And we hope to kind of bring that around the globe to different areas and like really engage with developers in their community in smaller settings and like get back to um, just like the roots of like building these cities um, developer communities. You, you know what, Lee? I think that is an excellent approach in the way we um, outreach as DevX. You just gave me an idea. Because <clears throat> just thinking out loud here, I have our front end framework. Um, he's a, he's an engineer here. His name's Blake. He he maintains the Faust Next JS uh, open source um, framework that we have here at WP Engine. He told me when he asked me, he said, "Hey, Lee Robinson's come on your podcast." I was like, "Yeah, dude, I'm super stoked." He's like, "I Lee was in Austin, and I went to the Vercel meetup, and and it was super fun." I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh man, I'm I didn't know you were in Austin." But it was super small, but he yeah. said it was just really like that much more rich because it was that small group. I don't know how mm -hmm. many were there in Austin, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, man, Austin's a tech hub. To, I, I probably should host one, but let me know when you're back in Austin, Lee. It would be fun to meet up in person and catch some uh, dinner or something when you're in town. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we've been kind of slowly validating that this like a local meetup approach is is what we want to do and so far i think we've done you know four or five of these and they've been okay. really successful for us to figure out how can we engage with the community how can we get people back together in person in a way that makes sense that's focused on like providing value to them at the same time also thinking about like our bigger events like a next.js conference that'll happen later this year um, and like thinking about how we get the entire global community engaged and excited about that. When is the next co conference? Please? Um, we haven't released the official date yet, but oh, okay, it will okay. be it will be later this year. Uh, hopefully, within the next month, there will be some communications on that. So we'll see. It's okay. it's going to happen. We can get the we can get the excitement going. I think people some people might have assumed there would be an event. There's usually one every year, but yes, it's definitely happening. Uh, uh, cool. It's going to be fun. Let me ask my boss if he'll pay, and I will. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I no, expect but that? All that is fantastic because, like, I do think you're rightly like the nature of those larger events has certainly changed forever. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the hybrid thing will always be there. And I do imagine, I haven't been to an in-person event since the beginning of COVID, but I do mm -hmm. imagine for the in-person attendees, it has sort of changed the environment and the atmosphere to have these mm -hmm. kind of two simultaneous tracks going. 
Um, mm-hmm. But also I'm with you that I think the local uh, environments might be a little bit underserved now. I just moved to a new area and like just right before this, I was like, let me go see what, what Orlando JavaScript is doing. And it was like, I found their meetup page and their last meeting was marked as canceled in like March of 2020 and just nothing yeah. since then. So I do feel like, you know, that is a really noble effort to come and try and revitalize some of those local meetups. Cause I do think that uh, in a way they can, be a lot more thoughtful and impactful, especially when you have fewer people. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the while, at the same time, like I also remember a line from your article where it's like the content creation piece is key now. And I think that that's really important that we've always yeah. had this global audience and perhaps those people were underserved with the previous model of developer advocacy. Because I can remember a couple of my early interactions with dev advocates or evangelists early on in my career. And that's what it was. It's like, they were the kind of sage on stage person walking you through a demo at a large mm-hmm. conference and like they would fly from here to there. And so it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's cool to watch that stuff shift in real time. The, um, but it, oh, I was sorry, just going to say one, one note on that, I think is that the, the in-person conference speakers are still incredibly valuable and it's like a, a very unique skill set to be able to do that well. But then you're also contrasting that against this new generation of creators, the people who were born on the YouTube videos of the world, the TikToks of the world, like the short form videos mm-hmm. and even like Twitter videos, like it's it's a such faster distribution of content to get it out to people and the medium and the format of that content is a lot different. It's kind of wild when you realize that you can get the same amount of reach sometimes by putting up a five minute YouTube video about something yeah. as spending a month prepping for a talk in yeah. person. It like makes you, it makes you more selective on the hyper local, hyper global thing. It's like, well, if I'm gonna go with this big hyper global thing, like maybe it should be distributed in a different medium, you know? Yeah. For sure. Uh, And if we could circle back, uh, I know I peppered you with a couple of questions all at once, but do you think you could talk about how you view the difference between developer experience and developer relations Um, and just how those two things mm -hmm. fit together? Yeah, I think um, DevRel is kind of a, it's a pillar or a part of developer experience. It's um, maybe a subset of what I think about developer experience as a whole. It also depends on the type of company you're working at. Like for developer focused companies, I think that these two are extremely closely related. If you are, you know, if you're building a a company where you just have an API on the side, the developer experience of that is important, but the developer relations might actually be the most important thing because okay. it's it's just trying to draw back people into using this like you're not an entirely software company. You just have this one API versus like mm-hmm. a developer first company or a dev tools company. Like the developer experience is the bread and butter of everything that you're doing. And the developers are your customers really. So when I think about developer experience or DX, I feel like it's really about education, community and documentation are like really some of the, the three ones that I think about the most. There's some other things in there too, like the type of examples or templates that you create. But by and large, we spent a lot of time today talking a lot about community. Um, education, we haven't gotten to as much, but I, I think it, it ties back to the DevRel piece and like how you're actually getting your content into the world and how you're structuring it to make sure that it's valuable for people of all different skill levels. Uh, and then documentation is is one that I think is so critical for dev mm-hmm. tools. It's just making sure that it serves both the reference use case as well as the learning use case. And the okay. reference use case is like I think about Next.js a lot, which is, you know, someone else maybe made the decision to use Next.js for my job. I show up at work. I didn't make this choice, but I hit a bug and I'm trying to solve it. So I go to the Next.js website. I don't care about anything else other than how I solve this bug. Like, just (laughs) tell me, just give me the information I need. Give me the code that I can copy paste and just fix my thing. And then I want to go home and go to bed. Like, that's all I care about. And you have to think about those type of (laughs) developers too. They're like semi-angry at you. They're like, like, am I using this? Ah, 
I'm just trying yeah. to get my kid to soccer yeah. practice. Let me give me the code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to squeeze in these last two questions for you, Lee, in respect to your time. And we really appreciate it. But so obviously at WP Engine, we're trying to make WordPress not left in the dust, if you will, with the purpose built headless EMSs, because I'm going to make an assumption here, Lee. Have you used WordPress before? In yes. your, you've used WordPress. <laughs> yes. I think everybody's messed with it, right? Even my mom yep. has typed in content in the block editor. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, nice. I was wondering, man, um, in, in your opinion, maybe one or two um, like features or functionalities it might need, what might it need to do WordPress as a headless CMS in order to not be left in the dust with the Jamstack movement decoupled? modern mm -hmm. um, web architectures. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So one thing that I find really interesting and it, 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 it relates back to this, so I'll, I'll start off with this, is the concept of dark matter developers. They've, it's been referenced in a lot of different ways, but it's basically like the, the folks who are using your tools that maybe aren't on GitHub discussions and maybe aren't oh, yeah. on social media, but they have to use it for their job every day. And when I think about WordPress, I think a lot about these type of developers because the sheer volume of people who are building and shipping WordPress sites today is enormous. It, it powers a large part of the web. And a lot of these developers are happily using the tool and they're not really engulfed in some of the, the things that we talk about a lot of the time. So what's interesting for me and how I see WordPress evolving in the future is you have this whole community of, of developers. Maybe some of them are tuned in to some of these new ways of building for the web. Some of them are kind of happy with where things are at right now. And as they look to move into this world, maybe they, I like to root it back in like tangible product requirements. So maybe I've got a, a hosted WordPress site serving millions of visitors a month. It's been running since 2005 and it's been going great for a while and now we just got this requirement from our you know from the business side that we want to improve the performance of how fast pages load and also improve the search engine optimization because we're getting outranked by one of our competitors okay those are two like very tangible products or problems to solve so now as this developer maybe they haven't been in tune with some of the things that are happening. They know that they have WordPress. They have thousands maybe of content editors who are in there writing stuff. Maybe it's like a food blog or something. They have a whole team of people just like shipping WordPress stuff and they have all these custom WordPress plugins. It's just, it's like a multi-year, multi-million dollar project if they were to try to move from WordPress to another CMS or another editor. And they don't, it's not really worth it for them. Like they're getting value out of WordPress. The part that they're concerned about is the front end performance and the SEO. So then they, they they start reading into this. They learn about the headless space and they say, okay, how are people building headless today? Well, the most common way that people are building something Greenfield brand new project is probably with React. And if they're choosing React, a lot of folks are choosing Next.js. And I think that that's why we see a lot of a lot of folks building with a headless WordPress Next.js stack, they are revisiting this ecosystem after you know some time away. And a lot of these things have matured and stabilized a lot where now you can, you know, within, I don't know, within five minutes, you can deploy a Next.js headless WordPress template. You can swap in like some API keys to hook up to your WP engine instance. And like, you're, you're kind of off to the races, like on working on your modernization effort and you can start testing the performance of your new version versus the old one. And then it makes a pretty clear case to the company. Like, yep, this is definitely faster. This is worth the investment. Like, let's keep pushing this direction. Yeah. I, and I, and I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think that's the approach that we've made here in trying to make it because I think at the end of the day, Lee, like you nailed it on the head. It's that those enterprise level organizations that have like maybe a marketing team and content editors of 200 
mm -hmm. right? And they're just used to the content editor and the Word, WordPress experience. I think it's essentially in order to keep up with the decoupled Jamstack movement as well, is making it more developer friendly because it's already marketing friendly. Honestly, it's it's already mm -hmm. content yeah. editor friendly. The more developer friendly we can make it, especially with like WP GraphQL with Jason Ball here and all those things. I don't. I I, I honestly, to your point, I don't think it's going to be left in the. I think it's just going to go sail along right with the. And this might be like, I might get like negative likes on this on Twitter, but I think it's going to flow along right with like the sanities, the contentfuls, the um, mm -hmm. graph CMSs of the world. That's my opinion. But anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, you just have to look at it from a pure market share perspective. Like all of these companies who are using WordPress on a long enough timeline, a, a decent chunk of them are going to be considering moving to a headless solution. It's just it, it it seems inevitable to me. Mm -hmm. And maybe I've maybe I've, you know, drank the Kool-Aid a little <laughs> bit too much. But like that 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 seems like the trend that I'm seeing. And I think that what's interesting is that trend can also exist while other net new, um, whether it's a, a sanity or other similar solution in the world, while those are also serving other pretty mm -hmm. interesting needs, you just can't the the gravity of WordPress is so compelling because of how well it's serving content editors too. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other valuable insight in, in what you said is about the dark matter developer, because mm -hmm. we definitely have a tendency to think of the people that we see represented on like Twitter and YouTube and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all the while under the surface, there's this whole other part of the iceberg that you're not even really aware exists. And I can remember Chris Coyer from CSS Tricks wrote an article about headless WordPress a couple of years ago and whether or not it was niche. And at that time, just the Gatsby source WordPress plugin had like a million plus downloads. And so mm -hmm. it's like, uh -huh. can it be niche if there's a million people using this? And mm -hmm. that's only one frame, you know, like that's just Gatsby. So my favorite example of dark matter developers is Facebook groups. I'm in yes. some like next yes. Facebook groups <laughs> and like the people who post on there they have just completely different needs and requirements than the type of people that you see even on like GitHub discussions or on mm -hmm. Twitter like they're very much focused in like here's the problem I have like I'm just trying to get my stuff done I don't care about the new latest feature really I just I just want to figure out I'm trying one. to get to soccer practice yeah yeah <laughs> yes. yeah yeah um Lee we have about like two minutes last fun question um myself and our audience probably wants to know so when you're not coding or if you're like frustrated and like why is this not working and you step away mm -hmm. from the from the computer what, what do you what do you like to do to clear your mind have fun is, is it running rock climbing what do you do lee but besides mm -hmm. listening to leon bridges yeah well music is a huge part of my life i listen to a lot of music and i also like to play instruments awesome. so i've been playing guitar for a really long time and something i really enjoy doing um, I also, in terms of like physical activities, I've really been into biking, cycling lately. Um, I like to go to the gym when I'm just trying to blow off some steam to, um, try to stay, try to stay healthy, try to stay active as, as well as I can. And then in terms of just like personal stuff too, like spending time with my wife and with my family and with my friends, um, try to make sure I have that good distancing when I need it. Like I'm, I'll be on vacation this Friday, so that'll be fun. Oh, awesome. and you're and you're completely when you're on vacation, do you literally you don't look touch a dot you don't look at GitHub, you don't do you just decompress and tune out to Yeah, clear? it's funny. Uh when you look at my GitHub contribution history, <laughs> it's like a lot and then just like literally nothing for a week, not a single thing. Cause when I tune out, I'm like, I'm going on vacation this week, like goodbye. I shut down all my stuff and I just never think about it. And that works really well for me to like recharge and reset because when I'm on. I give it my all. I like, I really try to do my best work. And then when I need a break and I need to recharge, I go on vacation for a week and I go sit on a beach somewhere and have a margarita and just kind of relax. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd be kind of, you know, I'd be stokedly like, um, so there's, you know, Austin, Texas is like 
the self-proclaimed live music capital of the world. Yeah, it, it, it really cool. is. On the Sixth Street, is that it, Fran? Yeah, Sixth I was Street there on is a just Tuesday band. night, and oh, dude. every band in there was better than any other live bar band I've ever seen. It was fantastic. It would be awesome if Vercel hosted a meetup with Lee and then Lee played like a venue nice. in Austin. <laughs> yes. And after the oh, meetup, you just go see Lee play. I mean, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and then need to start practicing now. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll come, bring my guitar, we'll do some Leon Bridges covers. That would That'd be, be fun. Sick. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, we definitely want to be respectful of your time, Lee. Again, thank you so much for yeah. coming on. Um, we had a great discussion today. We touched on a lot of different interesting topics. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're really happy to have you here. So yeah. thanks again. Thanks thank again, you for having Lee. me. And I probably yeah. will ask you back. So thank you, Lee. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to come back. <laughs> All right. Brother. All right. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. See ya. Yep. Bye.